Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending upon where you are. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, there are still people joining. We've got over 400 people registered for this discussion, which is fantastic. We're delighted that so many people are here. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, of course, to our panelists for supporting this event and agreeing to participate in the discussion. Uh, you will have seen some more comprehensive biographies of our panelists when you registered, but let me make some brief introductions. First of all, um, Ben Goldsmith is the founder and CEO of Manhattan PLC, an investment trust focusing on energy and resources. And Ben is also very well known as a philanthropist and advocate for environmental issues. Uh, Rajiv Joshi is the founder and CEO of Bridging Ventures, which campaigns, consults, and incubates new business models to help create a regenerative future for all. Raj is an economist, entrepreneur, and activist with two decades of experience in business transformation and social change. And here we are, we've been joined by Juliet. Welcome, Juliet. Juliet Davenport. Hi, Jessica. Our sorry. Third panelist. Um, Juliet founded Good Energy which is, was one of the UK's first entirely renewable electricity suppliers and generators. And Juliet has been an innovator in energy for over 20 years, working on ideas to fight climate change and transform the sector for the better. Um, finally, uh, Jack Chelman is in the background. He's our strategic communications manager, and um, he'll be managing your questions when, when we get to the Q&A and will step in for me in, in the event my connection fails. So a bit of admin. We intend that today's session should take just under an hour. We will finish up before 4 p.m. So those of you who have commitments at 4 p.m. will be able to make them. We're gonna cover a range of topics with our panelists and then we'll open up for questions from you, the audience. So throughout the session, please do type questions into the Q&A using the icon with the two speech bubbles. And we'll ask as many of these as we can to the panel when we come to the Q&A section. Do also use the chat to share thoughts throughout but note that we will only be posing questions to our panel that are posted into the Q&A. Uh, finally, my name is Jasper Judd. I'm one of the trustees of the Global Returns Project, alongside Jan Swiderski, who was going to be hosting today, but has been unable to for personal reasons. As a reminder, the Global Returns Project is a not-for-profit organization that mobilizes people with savings and investments to reinvest in Earth. That means to give a tiny proportion of those savings and investments every year to not-for-profit climate solutions. And we're running a campaign to persuade financial institutions to offer their clients this option as part of normal business. Now, giving to the best climate charity, charities is the most effective climate action that many, many people can take. In fact, our research suggests that reinvesting in Earth to the tune of just 600 pounds a year could be as much as 100 times more effective than any other individual climate lifestyle choice. Now, today's webinar is the second installment of our Capitalism and the Climate Crisis panel series. In the first event of the series in March, our panelists helped illuminate the fundamental relationship between capitalism and climate change, how markets and competition contribute positively and negatively to the climate emergency, and whether alternatives to or reform of our capitalist system are desirable and practical. Today, in the future of energy in a capitalist world, we will be approaching the topic through the lens of the energy transition. That is to say, the transition from energy base based on fossil fuels, which is poised to reshape the global economy. In their October 2020 Rethinking Energy report, the independent think tank Rethink X argued that we are on the cusp of the fastest, deepest, most profound disruption of the energy sector in over a century. The capacity, capacity costs for photovoltaic solar, offshore wind and lithium ion batteries have fallen dramatically in just the last decade, with many predicting a huge shift to renewable sources of electricity by 2030. So today we're going to ask what these energy innovations reveal about capitalism's climate implications and how the future of energy will shape and be shaped by our capitalist world. So. Let's begin our discussion by thinking about how we arrived at this moment of energy transition. Um, Juliet, I'd like to start with you, if that's all right. Um, yes. Right. When you founded Good Energy in 1999, 98% of the UK's electricity was non-renewable. And by 2020, renewable energy made up around 42% of the UK's electricity output. 
exceeding the percentage from gas and coal. So what role do you think capitalism, and here I mean markets, competition, the profit motive, et cetera, has played in expanding the UK's renewable energy availability so dramatically? So I think, I think first of all, you have to look at the marketplace itself and, and what, um, what, what the market incentives were for investment at the time. And I think we've been through kind of maybe three, four different types of incentives that allow people to come in and invest. And I think, I think what we've seen in terms of capitalism and where you can deploy cash at speed is when everything is pointing in the right direction. So where you have all the pieces aligned. So whether that's the technology at a reasonable cost, whether that's the marketplace and the ability to invest within a structural structured um, uh, format, and whether then you can actually, whether there's a tax incentive or whether something else aligned. If you get all of those aligned, you mobilize capital very, very fast. And actually what's quite interesting about that is that I've seen schemes where um, particular types of capital have been mobilized. So in the original schemes in the UK of something called the non-fossil fuel obligation schemes, um, what was fascinating about that is those schemes tended to end up mobilizing money within the existing system. So it didn't bring a lot of external capital in it. What you saw was a lot of the existing utilities using those schemes to invest in, in, in systems. So you didn't get a lot of innovation at the time, didn't get a lot of challenge in the time. Um, as things moved on, when you saw very simple schemes, there was something called the feed-in tariff scheme, which is incredibly simple, which meant that an individual householder could use the, the, the feed-in tariff scheme as well as a wider marketplace. Now that deployed capital incredibly fast. And what we actually saw was government get very cold feet over the feed and tariff scheme and pull it back very fast because capital was deploying so fast. Actually, it was at the time when the solar prices were coming down hugely at the same time. So the returns were huge. Um, if you could get in there early enough. I've, I've actually just been one of these, I was slightly late. I actually had to go somewhere, which is fairly unusual. And um, I went to a site where they, where they put some solar in in 2012 in that initial peak time. And actually the, the tariffs were, were huge at that point. So I think what we've seen is that um, capitalism has been very important. Money has been very important in terms of being deployed at speed. It's deployed from different parts of the industry, depending on the market structure. Um, and one of the things that is just apparent is that governments don't always keep up with it. So sometimes they deploy things. So what, one of the schemes we saw, which was less in the renewable space, more in the energy efficiency space, which was one of the um, green home schemes, just didn't work. I mean, it just, it fundamentally didn't work because it didn't put the incentives in the right place in the marketplace for anybody to want to invest either at an individual level or, or a corporate level. But something like the feed and tariff, which is very simple, very straightforward, brought a lot of money forward very fast at, and across the board that didn't just come from sort of big investors that came from individual investors as well. Um, and I think that those kind of simplistic mechanisms that are really easy to understand that are very transparent will bring money into the marketplace very fast. Thank you. And, and maybe Raj, um, it'd be interesting to get uh, your views on this. And, and, and also perhaps you could give us a view as to whether there are you know, any ways in which clean energy innovations are limited or hindered by capitalism. Yeah, well, I think that we are at a very interesting moment in history where the current energy system has taken us to this current crossroads. And um, in a way, we're, we're in a year where um, if we don't mark the end of the fossil fuel era and put some of the old uh, technologies like coal in the ground, then our ability to have emissions by 2030 um, in line with the science is, is you know, almost impossible. And so I think we, we urgently need to um, double down on the alternatives, but at the same time, we do need to make sure that we don't create unintended consequences. And that when we look back through this next clean energy revolution, we don't see the types of uh, it, impacts that we saw in the last industrial revolution um, which so deeply damaged ecosystems, so deeply damaged um, the rights of workers, um, as well as we celebrate, you know, all of the jobs that can be created and all of the in increase in standard of living that can be um, can be created. I 
particularly, for example, would look, at, can I zoom in on some of the key risk areas? Um, batteries, I think, are still an area where there's a lot of nascent technology. Um, I think Amnesty, Amnesty International came out with a report recently around how um, we need a moratorium on things like deep sea mining, um, where many of the, those kind of precious ecosystems, um, which are so precious for the deep decarbonization of our planet, um, that those that this could be disrupted and the indigenous communities and others who live, um, whose kind of coastal regions would be affected by that, their rights are not being upheld. If you look at cobalt, if you look at some of the key minerals that are being mined in the production of what we what sits inside of our computers and our mobile phones and our com uh, and under the hood of our um, of our electric vehicles, there is really a risk that there's a lack of accountability for the new industry. Um, and so I think there is something of a gap in the marketplace um, and within civil society around holding the new accountable as we build it and ensuring that. It's credible. There are cred there are credible solutions out there, which there are, um, and that those credible solutions are really lifted up. But at the same time, where there are solutions that perhaps create harm, that we we work together to figure out how we reduce that harm, um, so that we really make a just transition. Um, and so, just to finish on that, I would say, as we power the future, we need to learn the lessons of how we've powered our world up until now, and that includes not just um, looking at power from the perspective of the extractive model, um, but also recognizing that the extractive model um, to get to the core of your question around capitalism, um, that extractive model you know, was, was also born out of slavery, out of taking oil out of uh, whales, and then taking that same oil out of the ground. Um, and now we need to look at a model which gives more than it takes perhaps, um, which speaks more to nature-based solutions, which speaks more to regeneration. And I, I know that's a lot of work that Ben and others have been spending so much of their time on. So, so look forward to hearing more for them, from them on that. But um, that's my perspective. I think it's time for us to really think about what does a just transition look like um, as we make this energy shift. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting, Raj. Um, perhaps, Ben, uh, just to sort of circle back to you as um, both an investor and a philanthropist, you know, get, get your perspective on this issue of energy and capitalism? I mean, I guess um, with, within a free market enterprise system, I think that the role that philanthropists have played in funding groups that have helped to expose where costs have been borne by society that should actually have been borne by the companies creating those issues has been one of the most useful interventions. So to take a farming example, before I talk about energy, if I've got a factory farm uh, in, uh, in, in South Dakota or in the Carolinas that is pumping enormous amounts of pollution into the air that is breathed by local communities or into the river, um, into the drinking water, into the soil um, and out into the sea killing fish stocks, well, all of those costs are borne by society, um, thereby um, uh, enabling the pig producer to sell pork at an artificially low price. And so the role of NGOs in identifying those externalities and ensuring that those costs are in fact internalized levels the playing field. And I think that's what we saw in, in Europe when it came to coal versus renewables. The work of organizations like Client Earth, which brought legal actions against coal produced, coal fired power station operators for the air quality harm they were doing and the sickness that they were causing to communities living within the vicinity of those coal fired power stations. So, so conservatives, free market enterprise people like to talk a lot about free markets um, uh, I think they're only really genuinely free and fair markets when these externalities are internalized. And so that's been a really, really useful thing that philanthropists have done, has been to work on, on that side of things. And um, I, I like the stat that you quoted at the start, which is uh, the enormous impact that philanthropy can have, an enormous impact that philanthropy, um, uh, the enormous role that it has to play in, in these kind of transitions. <coughs> Thank you. Well, um, perhaps uh, it'd be a good time just to um, come back to you, Juliet. Um, in a piece that you wrote for Forbes in February, you argued that innovating to net zero emissions isn't just about new technologies, it's about rethinking how the energy system works and creating new marketplaces to support customers. And there's, there are writers on climate change who blame our emergency on the rise of consumerism, on the sort of steady rise in individualistic materialism. Am I right in saying that you see consumers as a force for good? And would you mind expanding on that? 
Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've always thought of consumers as a force of good, but we just need to make sure that they've got the structures within the place to be able to allow them to be good. So so right now, if you go and buy energy um, as a consumer, most of the time, there is no difference to you whether you buy energy at two o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the evening. And we all know that if we go and get on a train, there's peak hours and off peak hours. That's exactly the same in the energy market, but we've never empowered consumers to really be part of that conversation. And what, what, what happens is that everybody wants to come home, put the kettle on at five o'clock. It's the highest carbon point of the day. It's the highest cost part of the day. And yet we've never incentivized consumers to be part of the solution to switch off at that time. Now, that's starting to emerge now. We're beginning to see experimental tariffs come up to try and engage consumers in that. But previously, we've really had a pat on the head. Don't worry, dear, we'll keep the lights on for you. It doesn't matter what the cost or what the environmental cost. And actually, I think consumers well engaged can really be part of the answer to this. Um, when somebody told us to all start recycling, we did. And, and I think most people now in their homes, the thought of not recycling feels quite odd. And I, I genuinely believe that consumers don't want to be exploitive of the earth, do want to have more um, clean air, do want to be part of the solution. It's part of engaging that, that populist force to really do that. And whether that's from a capital point of view, them investing in that, or whether that's from a behavioral point of view, them responding to that, I think either side, I think it's incredibly important. And, and that doesn't have to be just certain parts of our society as well. It can be across the board. We just need to have the tools to do that. And, and the market structure previously has not allowed us to do that. Now we're going to, we're starting to see announcements about how the way the market works that will allow consumers to be part of this, but to date they haven't been. Thank you. And, and I mean, Raj, uh, you mentioned uh, just earlier about some, um, uh, you know, extractive capitalism, and you've arg argued for a business shift from a sort of compete and consume mindset to one of collaborating and conserving. What do you think about the role of consumers and consumerism in relation to energy? Yeah, well, I do think we need more cooperation in the in the marketplace. Um, you know, clean and green R and D, for example. I remember when we launched the We Mean Business Coalition um, on the road through Paris. Um, we had Tim Cook uh, help with the launch event, and he said on this agenda we actually do need to cooperate. And um, I think we need more business leaders coming out to say, um, actually, if we are going to have emissions by 2030, we need um, new models around patents. And, and you know, we're seeing the wins that we're making on, on the vaccines, perhaps creating precedents around when there are public goods or there, there are collective action issues, we perhaps need to look at market solutions that are slightly different. Um, uh, and, and so I would say that I am both uh, looking at this from a supply side and a de demand side, I'm a both and economist. I think that we really do um, need to recognize that consumers have the power. And indeed, um, if we can figure out how to harness the consumer power um, that exists um, on, at the base, um, that that's exactly what we need to now do. That we don't, we've run out of time to, to purely do this from a supply side and that we need to figure out how to shift attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And that's where philanthropy can be really powerful because we're really talking about a global mindset shift. And if you look at the kind of content that um, this generation has been growing up on, um, we need to reprogram our minds a little bit around uh, our behavior and perhaps uh, you know, what, uh, what it is that incentivizes us to make decisions at the margin based on a set, set of preferences, which perhaps take into account our longer term well-being, not just our short term aspirations. And that's, uh, that's a big piece of the puzzle, which I think we need, we, need a, we need some of us to work on together to figure out how we get there. Um, but we, we also need to connect the dots between the storytellers and the activists and the investors and many other communities and, and, and build those bridges. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I, Ben, I, I want to come to you, but perhaps talk a little bit more about um, like where, how we move forward from here, because you often emphasize that as we deal with the climate crisis, we can't ignore the parallel crisis of nature. You just refer to Client Earth, who of course is one of our charity partners. Um, and many would argue that protect, protecting nature is particularly important right now as the energy transition picks up speed. So would you mind expanding a little bit on the nature crisis and how we take account of it as we move to new forms of energy? Yeah, I think um, so I'm optimistic 
that as far as decarbonizing our economies go, you know, we're on a pretty good pathway. You know, I, I, I think we're going to get there. You know, we're moving into a world in which demonstrably renewable energy is the cheapest source of, of power generation. The world is electrifying transportation systems. Buildings are becoming more efficient. It seems to me like the world really has well and truly woken up and we are um, on the right track. Um, the problem is, even if we do it all in time, it's not enough. I think if we don't also start to uh, piece back together the terribly depleted natural flat fabric of the planet, I think we're toast. And, um, and, and that's the bit on which we need to wake people up. And I think that the, one of the silver linings of um, the COVID crisis has been that people across much of the world did have a chance to dwell upon the central importance of, of healthy, diverse, abundant nature in their lives, not just for their physical health, but for their spiritual health. And so I do feel like something of an awakening has taken place. I don't know about listeners, but I, I received a whole bunch of videos during that first lockdown of dolphins cavorting in kind of a deserted Trieste harbor and families of wild boar trotting through the streets of central Berlin and of the view of the Himalayas seen from, from uh, north of Delhi for the first time through clean air um, in, in a generation. Now, I, I think there was a kind of awakening that's taken place. And, and, and I, I think that um, in solving all of these things, I think in part, it's, it's about economics. It's about a cost benefit analysis. You know, it, is, it makes for better economic sense to solve some of these issues, to fix nature, to, to internalize externalities. But that's not gonna be enough. That kind of contract is not enough. What, what we really need is, is a reconnection on a, on a deeper level, both individually and, 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 and collectively with the natural world. Uh, we, we, the, the central purpose of humanity, in my view, is to find harmony with the biosphere. And, and I think unless we get that kind of moral or, or emotional or, if you like, religious commitment to, to finding a way to, to integrate our systems frictionlessly with, with natural ones, we're not going to get there. And, uh, and so, so I think the economics of it are, are hugely important, but they're not the whole part of the story. And if I may, I'll just give an example of where I think where we're, we're headed in the right direction in respect of nature and economics. Um, so so um, the, the Wessex Water Company was faced with the prospect um, several years ago with spending up to a billion pounds on a new plant in Pool in Dorset for filtering phosphates and nitrates out of the drinking water. And a bright spark within Wessex Water named, named uh, 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 Guy Thompson um, uh, uh, suggested to, to executives that the company pay landowners and farmers further up the catchment simply to stop using nitrates and phosphates. The result of that is a deal which falls under a heading called N-Trade, if people want to look it up, E-N-T-R-A-D-E, -E, in which the Wessex Water Company pays several millions of pounds each year to farmers in that catchment no longer to use nitrates and phosphates on the land. And so economically, this was a hugely important decision for Wessex Water, um, uh, significantly positive economically, um, and also has led to dramatically improved nature outcomes in that catchment. In fact, it's become a bit of a stock exchange. The Environment Agency has come into that market and provided additional payments to those same farmers and landowners to help reduce flooding in Pool by allowing trees and vegetation and nature to recover on the steeper valley bottom, steeper slopes and the valley bottoms and so on. Um, there are now 12 such stock exchanges in, in the works up and down the United Kingdom, stock exchanges for environmental services. So here's an example of the market correctly applying uh, a fair economic value to the services provided by healthy, restored na natural systems. And um, I, think that, um, I think that's a really important part of the matrix, uh, but it ain't enough. Thanks, Ben. Um, Juliet, do you have a perspective on, on this and the, the sort of relationship between energy and the natural environment? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's really interesting about the natural environment, I think there are places where we can start to price it into a process. I, I do think quite a lot of it, finally, though, if we're going to see it at scale, will be driven by regulation at some form. So some kind of regulated base that then we can see investment off the back of. Um, and I think biodiversity additionality is going to be an area where we're going to see this particularly come through with development. Um, I also see, I think, a lot of the planning game work that was done 
when renewables was really expanding at pace between 2012 and 2015, I know that we had to forward trade in world flower seeds at one point to make sure that we had enough to develop a lot of the solar farms that we were doing at the time. And I think, I think there is, there is there is a part of it that we can drive, but I do I agree with both speakers that we need to start to think of this this it's a, removing the extractive industry and kind of really trying to think of it in 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 the in the ultimate of the circular economy. Um, uh, one of the books, the uh, the donut economics books by Kate Raworth, is is really fundamentally trying to say. Uh, this planet isn't infinite. Um, and when I last looked, there wasn't anything else like it out there, despite what we keep talking about, about Mars. And therefore, making sure that we can live within the planetary bound lines is really important. And I, but, I, but I think to do this at scale, I think what we can do is in innovation technologies, um, we can start to explore uh, with some of this early capital and particularly philanthropic capital, capital but finally, when we really want to roll it out at pace and at speed, we're going to need to have that underpinned by the regulatory framework to make sure it happens. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to come to you, Raj, on this, and perhaps we could just also um, feed into it that the issue of inequality, both between countries and within countries, because you speak often about the importance of tackling inequality. And you've tied the problem to the energy transition as well, the fact that over a billion people still live without access to electricity. So it'd be interesting to understand your perspective on how uh, we might use this period of energy transition to reduce inequality in a meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly believe that climate, climate, climate and nature, the, the impacts we're having on our climate and on nature, the ecosystem decline that we're seeing and the gross inequality that we see are two sides of the same coin. And that we, at the root cause of both is an economic system that is out of balance. And where those of us who have studied history of economics can see where in society, we, we've, we've decided to pick and choose which elements of economics we decide we, we put into our system. Um, you know, Adam, Adam Smith, uh, before he wrote Wealth of Nations, in the theory of moral sentiments, he wrote, how selfish soever a man may be supposed. He should have said women too. Um, <laughs> there are evidently some principles in their character that interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he gains nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So he was actually speaking about altruism as the basis of our economic system and um, this hidden force, right? <laughs> Um, which actually does drive human connection, but which isn't necessarily reflected in our social contract. And so I think when Ben speaks to the need to renew that, co that contract, I think that we are in a moment in our history where there really is a need to, to look at that contract again and think about what is our agreement with each other and what is our agreement with the planet that we live on and, and how do we uh, elevate that beyond its political dimension um, and there may be, you know, and I'm, I do hear from faith leaders and others who think it is time for a new, um, a, a new way of standing up on these issues that reflects who we are. Um, uh, in, in, and, and I think that's a, a voice that we should also make sure is, is it listened to in this discussion. So I appreciate Bren, Ben raising that. Um, I think that we need to look at the fundamental structure of the economic system, the distributional effects that, that are ha happening in terms of the fact that we do have billions of people living in extreme poverty, the gap is still widening. We only have less than 2% of the Global South vaccinated right now. Um, you know, we, we have the equivalent of an, of an apartheid in terms of what the impacts have been um, of COVID-19. And if we can't learn the moral lessons of that now, our ability to, fight, to tackle the, the climate crisis and to deal with ecosystem breakdown um, in a way that is, a, is the acid test. And, and so I would, really, I would really say that we would need to come to the core at the center at how do we ensure that our policy de deal with these externalities properly, that we manage um, issues around monopoly, we manage is issues around broken in incentive structures um, and, and tax systems that incentivize good behavior and disincentivize bad behavior. 
um, and really start to pull things back into balance. Um, and, and that needs to happen quite quickly. And hopefully the G7, the G20 and the COP this year provide that initial push, but it's a, it's a decade long push in my, in my view. And we, need to, we really need a movement of movements to help drive it forward. Thanks, Raj. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sort of keeping an eye on time here and I think that um, I did want to make sure that we covered, uh, if you like, the sort of future um, of energy and the sort of destination we're heading towards. Um, we've already discussed that, um, you know, renewable energy technology is becoming increasingly cheap and accessible. Um, there is a concern in some quarters that these changes will fail to disrupt fossil fuels that will add more renewables to our energy portfolio rather than substituting fossil fuels with clean energy. Juliet, it'd be interesting to get your perspective on how you think capitalism will affect the longevity of fossil fuels, even as renewables become more common. So I think it depends on which part of capitalism you're looking at. If, if you're looking at the natural, um, so, so I think, I, I quite often think of large corporates like sort of um, uh, sort of organic bodies. So, so they try and protect themselves. They have an immune system that tries to defend themselves against any disruption or any infection. And if you think about market change and you think about new technologies, they are basically disrupting those organisms. So they're trying to, so, so there is no reason why a large company would want to invest in a technology that takes away their market. Because, and, and that's fundamentally what we're asking them to do. We're fundamentally asking a lot of very large corporates who have a lot of capital to deploy. And they deploy that capital, not just in terms of investment. And that's what we do have to remember is there is a lot of capital that is deployed in terms of lobbying government. And this is part of the capitalist structure that we actually have. So, so when you enter into a market as a new entrant, you're not just facing trying to compete in a market. You're also trying to face competing with a regulatory regime which is dictated to by the existing incumbents and I think that is a real piece that government therefore has a really important role to be strong and not be lobbied by uh, sort of not be lobbied for the continuation of the systems that we already have in place so I think I think from my point of view um, I think we, we really have to uh, look at the whole system um, understand what impacts it today and how can you get innovation coming through at speed that's going to disrupt? Because um, in, in terms of the, the question on, on renewables, renewables can absolutely replace fossil fuels. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It just depends what you add to them. And there's, there's these constant arguments. So the first argument we always had to deal with was baseload. Well, you don't need baseload to run an energy system. The second argument we then heard is that consumers won't change their behavior. Well, that's absolute rubbish because we've seen proof that they will change their behavior. So you can change the shape of the energy system that you need to deliver to. Um, so I think, I mean, part of the work we're just doing, and actually we're going to be launching a report that talks about what does 100% renewable Britain look like and what does it take to do that and what investment do you need to do that? You can absolutely do these things. It just depends who's lobbying and getting in the way of that investment. To be honest, and, and that that is the that that is the piece we have to be absolutely honest about. Um, and if we are honest about that, then we can start to work out actually how do we. And my personal view is the way to empower every individual in this country to be part of renewables is to give them all a solar panel, um, whether they put it in their garden, on the roof, or give it to a friend. If you engage people in power, one, they change their behavior, and two, you're no longer concentrating the power in one place. That's what oil pipelines do. It's what gas pipelines do. They concentrate power. If you distribute it, suddenly you see a massive shift in the marketplace. And my, my personal view is the best thing we could do is give everybody a solar panel in this country. Excellent. Um, well, thanks, Juliet. Um, ben, maybe just come back to this issue of nature. Um, do you think that a renewed focus on natural capital, that's to say protecting and renewing our natural you know, environment, uh, could help permanently disrupt our reliance on fossil fuels? I mean, I think we need to, to sort of add to Julius, I think we need a price on carbon. I, th I think um, you know, the emissions trading scheme started trading in the UK yesterday. Um, I, we, we need a ubiquitous, reasonable price on carbon worldwide. Um, that will level the playing field in all sorts of arenas. Um, I mean, to take it away from energy and into, for, again, farming, 
um, I, I live near a landscape called the Somerset Levels. Um, this was a great wetland. Um, this was a 140,000 acre wetland, a kind of great shimmering inland sea. There were pelicans there when James I was on the throne. And Glastonbury was an island. Now this place would have teemed with life like we can barely imagine today. And it was drained for agriculture a little bit in the earlier centuries, but principally since the Second World War, they were still building canals and installing massive pumps in the 1970s. And today, most of that landscape is dry. It's kind of concave. It's a great, dry, relatively low grade agricultural landscape. The emissions from the peat underneath the Somerset levels as they dry out are equal to the emissions of everything else in Somerset combined each year. The airports, the towns, the roads, the manufacturing, the houses. If you were to re-wet the levels, allow the water back in, you would, you would halve the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of that county of Somerset as well as uh, creating a very, very important wetland, a uh, kind of Camargue of, of Great Britain, a kind of, a kind of Guadalquivir Delta, if anyone's been to the south of Spain. You could create something absolutely extraordinary in, in nature recovery terms, whilst also dramatically shifting emissions. Without a reasonable price on carbon, I don't see how that happens. Because at the moment, we've turned what should be a carbon store into a source of carbon emissions, but no one feels the economic pain from doing that, and no one would necessarily feel the economic gain from turning things around. So I think, think, think pricing carbon correctly, which really is the ultimate externality, is a key to, to, to delivering a kind of complete energy transition and is also a pretty important part of the equation when it comes to restoring nature as well. Thanks, Ben. Um, I, I'm, I'm keen to uh, take some questions from the audience and I'm sure Raj, you've got some views on this, but I'm, <laughs> I'm also keen to make sure we get, give everybody a chance to, uh, to participate. Um, I've got a question here, and perhaps Raj, you might take this first of all. Um, this is from Tony. Um, the question is that the insatiable need for ever increasing business profit seems to be a fundamental inhibitor to progress in this area. What suggestions does the panel have on how we can change this pivotal mindset, i.e. a harmful profit motive in capitalism? Mm. Thank you for that question. Um, it was a little bit in my mind. I remember just before Paris, where we were all wrangling to get net zero into the agreement, um, there, were there were some of us who felt that fundamentally um, net zero is not, is not the ultimate goal, right? That doing less harm is not the, less, the, the ultimate goal of why we're here. Um, and that a net positive future is really what we're trying to get to. And there are, in Brazil and in many other countries, there are, there are companies who are trying to design their business models such that they, they, they are net positive and they are not just circular, but also regenerative. And I think that's where, um, you know, we're seeing that movement a lot in agriculture right now. Um, I, I do believe that we do need to see, um, you know, a lot more in terms of, uh, that the kind of move away from this extractive mindset uh, and even in the extractive mindset let's extract less and do less harm uh, so that there's a balance of anthropogenic emissions uh, in terms of what nature can offset for us toward a future where um, you know beyond the, the and, I, and I know this is kind of taking us beyond where, where we're even be at, at right now so we have to like we have a lot to do um, before we can get there but we have we have to make sure that our long-term vision is toward an economic model that aligns with what enables human beings to play a positive role on the planet. Because, you know, the question that I remember the head of Amnesty International or on Greenpeace saying once was, you know, the planet will still be here. Um, it'll just kick us off. And, uh, you know, the, the forests will eventually grow back and the, the seas will eventually, you know, life may come back. Um, but this isn't all about human beings saving earth, um, you know, the, the big planet that we live on, um, you know, it, it's also about the earth choosing whether or not it might wish to let, let us live. <laughs> and, um, and so I think right now we have a choice to make and um, if we can make it through the, the pandemics um, and other things that are being sent our way, um, perhaps we, and change our ways, perhaps we can design a model which um, is actually more in balance, but also one which is, is, is a better model for us. And, and I, I really do, to close on that point, I think 
the social dimensions of this question. You know, when I spent two months during COVID in Jamaica, sitting with fishermen who were building a regenerative future and planting seaweed and Irish sea moss and blue crabs. And, you know, they, they were designing and developing a regenerative um, a model in the, in the sea with joy, uh, you know, but with less, less uh, uh, materialism. Um, I couldn't help but think uh, there's a lot we can learn from other parts of the world as we design our future. Um, and that needs to be kind of at the heart of our development model. Thanks. But that's maybe the Indian and the African parts of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Raj. I'm, I'm going to um, move on to a question uh, which is for um, Juliet. Um, this is from Mark in the audience. Uh, given that we're not in control of when the sun shines or the wind blows, do you believe that smart home electricity storage through batteries is a key part of the journey to decarbonizing our electricity? And surely buildings should all have on-site solar PV storage in a time of use tariff. Well, well, let's start with the end of that. The answer is absolutely yes. I mean, if, if it, my, my personal view is no house should be built without those capabilities. And whether you deliver storage through a stationary storage or whether you deliver it through the fact that you've already got an EV that's got an, a, a mobile storage in there, let's use technology smartly and effectively in terms of how we deploy it. Um, and I think, I think, I mean, the capitalism it feels it's quite an odd word to use generally, but I think that if we can use it in the positive sense to drive efficiency and think of it in that sense, then it can be helpful. We've just got to put the structure around it to make sure it includes all the externalities. I mean, in terms of in terms of um, the when the wind doesn't blow and when the sun doesn't shine, I mean, those aren't the only two renewable technologies out there. I mean, first of all, marine has been really underutilized in the UK. We have more marine capability, um, more marine resource technical potential than most European countries. We have one of the biggest tidal ranges in the world, and yet we are not using that. And we also have huge offshore capability in the form of offshore oil and gas. So we've got the, the engineering capability, we've got the technical potential but we don't seem to have the um, uh, political will to go first and it's really interesting this piece there's a question later on on innovation innovation is something I do not think we have spent enough time thinking about what it needs to do good innovation and innovation does not we have mistaken or I've seen mistaken too many times innovation for efficiency gain so there's a small innovations in existing industry that just makes something slightly better than it is already. For me, innovation, as I said in the in the Forbes article, was is about completely. Uh, somebody was talking about making more um, baked bean cans in a baked bean factory. My view is innovation is about when you get rid of the can. Um, it is it is a step change. It's a fundamental shift, and I don't think we are thinking big enough in terms of the way that we can deliver renewables into the system. Because one, we don't know what the demand side response can be. Two, we don't know how much more we can actually reduce the demand we need to run our homes. We haven't gone far enough into that. And three, uh, we, we fundamentally don't know what the net storage technology down the line is going to be. And we have to invest in that. The investment in R&D in the UK over the last 10 years in energy has been below 0.2 of a billion. If you look at the equivalent in aerospace, it's like 3.8. If you look at um, medical, it's 4.8. So we, we're just lagging behind in terms of getting on with innovation. And I think innovation doesn't deliver everything, completely understand. But if we want to engage consumer behavior plus new technologies, we need to start investing and being much cleverer about how we go about these things now. Um, thank you. Well, I, I, I've got a, a question um, from Jay in the audience. Um, and Ben, I, I'll perhaps start with you on this. Um, energy is the base of everything in modern economy stroke society. How is investment going to come in long term investment and usage in geothermal and nuclear heat stroke ele electricity sources? You don't understand that question. So I'm not mad about nuclear personally. I am. Um... I, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to live near a nuclear plant. Um, I think it's scary. I, I don't buy that it's particularly safe. I don't buy that it's clean. Um, and I certainly don't buy that it's cheap. I mean, the original slogan in the 50s or 60s was, it's safe, it's clean, and it's too cheap to meter. And I refute all three of those. 
Um, mostly, though, it just runs against the grain that, that, that Raj has laid out in a, in a comment just now around decentralized power. If we want resilience, you know, we want a, a dynamic, a resilient energy systems, and we want decentralized power generation. We want everyone with a solar panel on their roof, you know, gifted by Juliet's program. And we want we want small scale wind. We want a diversity of sources scattered through through the country. Um, we, we don't want 1960s style centralized power generation, huge, expensive white elephants. And I, I, I'm really um, unhappy with the with the Hinkley development um, in, in Somerset near me. Um, it's it, apart from being frightening. It, it's locking consumers into an unbelievably high price of power for the next 35 years during which time the cost of distributed safe uh, renewables is just going to keep on coming down. So I, I don't like nuclear at all. Um, there are plenty of environmentalists who disagree with me on this and see it as the best way to decarbonize our power systems quickly. Um, I, I'm not persuaded. Um, Geothermal is great. Um, I, I, um, the Icelandics have shown that it, it can work very well in the right places. And, um, and um, I, I think geothermal, especially when you're able to uh, use the heat to, to, to heat people's homes as well as um, uh, power them, I think, fantastic. Um, and by its very nature, geothermal is often decentralized as well. Um, there's, a, there's an infrastructure in the, in the Rift Valley, Kenya, that has about 200 different wells spread across 100 kilometers. Um, it's great. Um, Thanks. Um, uh, uh, Raj, I've got a question here from um, Jessica. Uh, who says, are you suggesting that a capitalist society only works if we have NGOs and philanthropists helping to avoid the externalities of capitalism? Instead, why not change the free market forces, stop natural monopolies and regulate the private sphere, particularly finance? Why not change from the top down and stop putting the onus on the consumer so much? I like fully that. agree with everything you just said. <laughs> um, I, I, we are on the same page. Uh, I believe that, ha that um, in order to create a more robust regulatory system because like every all economists have, ident have pretty much said that markets by themselves do not distribute resources fairly so there are distributional effects John Rawls there are externalities the you know the, the fishermen down the down the river um, pay the price from the nuclear plant or whatever is up the river um, in, in polluting so someone has to to, to manage for that uh, so I 100% I agree that um, uh, it should be about how the market is managed. However, I believe the reason we have philanthropy, which is meant to serve as our highest risk capital, doesn't always get used as highest risk capital, is to support civil society to exist in holding um, those actors accountable in order for those behavioral shifts to take place. And I think one of the challenges we have right now is that we have hollowed out civil society and we aren't investing in civil society and civil society where it has previously functioned really well um, has increasingly played a service delivery role. So it's displacing companies, it's displacing the role of governments in trying to deliver services in order to survive, in order to get income um, and in order to fill gaps. Truth, truthfully, in some cases, you do need civil society to fill gaps. There are governance deficits in some countries you do not have governance and there's humanitarian crisis and you need that. Um, but what's missing is that space for, for the accountability of companies and on governments to put the right rules in place, to change the rules of the game um, so that there is a level playing field. So I agree with you on that. And then I, I would just lastly say that um, I think indigenous wisdom is really helpful here also on the energy questions. Um, you know, our ancestors always looked at earth, water, wind, and fire as um, into the sun as, as a, the ways in which to harness um, energy. And, um, you know, we don't need to bring the sun to, to, the, to the earth. You know, so the, I think um, Juliet's uh, got this, her, her eye on the right solution there. Um, Biotherm, geothermal, you know, wave power, all, all of these solutions, if you, if you work them in a mix, uh, there, there are ways to do it. But Energy density is still a massive qu uh, question mark. And that requires us to look also at our development model itself and, and whether this model of urban, sorry, rural urban migration where everyone moves to the cities uh, is necessarily sustainable. And perhaps we need a model where people who increasingly are happy during COVID living outside of the cities 
um, are in communities where they do practice regenerative agriculture, where they do live off the land, but they also work the land. Uh, so there are some bigger questions for how we organize society that I think are also more fundamental that we need to be asking ourselves um, in addition to our energy questions. But um, I might leave that for another time. <laughs> um, thanks. Well, I, I, we are sort of approaching um, the end of this session. Um, I, I want to come back to each of you and I'll give you a bit of time to think about it with something positive uh, for our audience to take away. Um, but uh, before that, just let me thank the three of you again for um, taking the time to be with us today. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I'd like to make two quick points as well. First, a brief reminder that we plant one tree every time someone subscribes to the Global Returns Project mailing, mailing list. Um, you can subscribe for free on our website, which is globalreturnsproject.earth. And to subscribers also receive our fortnightly newsletter, and I'm sure a lot of them uh, are amongst the audience. Second, a reminder about reinvesting in Earth. As I mentioned at the beginning, our research has found that uh, reinvesting in Earth, supporting the Global Returns Project portfolio of climate not-for-profits could be as much as 100 times more effective than any other individual climate lifestyle choice. So if you are looking for a way to make a meaningful difference in combating the climate crisis, do consider reinvesting in Earth and go to our website to do so. Um, now, uh, coming back to uh, what I was saying just earlier, I'd like to come to each of you in turn and just with some sort of final positive thoughts for our audience and perhaps start with you, Ben. So I guess, um, I mean, the environmental movement has a tendency to, out of necessity, flip the kind of great Martin Luther King quote on its head. You know, the, the, the kind of refrain is, I have a nightmare. And, and, and so much time and energy and resource is devoted to stopping bad things from happening. And I think the emergence of a rewilding movement is um, one of the most optimistic and exciting and hopeful things that's happening in the world today. Um, it's everywhere, um, everywhere in the world. There are rewilding projects happening, uh, restoring natural processes, reintroducing missing native species, um, micro rewilding in people's gardens or, or, or along riparian river corridors and vast landscape scale projects such as Cairngorms Connect here in, in, in the UK. Um, or, 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 um, or Alula in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan's 10 billion tree tsunami. So I think, this is, um, I think this is a very, very important part of the mix and a very, very optimistic and exciting story, the, the, the rewilding story. Thanks, Ben. Um, and Raj, a, 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 thought, a positive thought from you. Uh, to follow Martin Luther King, I think uh, he also said the arc of the moral universe bends uh, towards justice. And um, I believe it bends because people change their minds and people bend, choose to bend it. And I think if you look at the young activists and movement builders out there acting together for the future, um, that we have a lot of hope and the rainbows that are being paint, painted in our, in our windows that just appear out of the minds of children, um, I think they're showing us that there's, there is a future and we need, to, we need to believe in that future to create it. Um, so I have a lot of hope. I just think um, we need to be, do, uh, it needs to be applied hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And Juliet, a final positive thought from you. So, um, so I would agree with both Ben and Raj. Um, I think, I actually think it's some of the really boring things that are happening that give me hope. And I know this sounds really strange, but sometimes it's the really dull stuff behind the scenes that no corporate governance, for example, something that puts the chills through most people of having to sit through a corporate governance part. But the fact that directors are going to have to start reporting on climate change emissions and the impact of their company on climate change, the fact that most large companies now have to see climate change as a risk to their business and it has to be included in their corporate governance and audit reports. Um, I think audit practice, I think we need to rethink audit practice with an environmental lens and the impact that we have on that and the valuation of businesses in relation to that and the way that we look at risk. And we also need to look at our tax system that should reflect, so EIS, SEIS investment should all have an environmental overview of it. So I think some of the really dull stuff 
I see some momentum happening on that. And I'm, Raj, I, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, the Future of Corporation report done by the British Academy and, and the Smith School. Um, I've been part of that. And, and the fact that we may see a future where companies include purpose and social and environmental purpose as a core part of their articles that they're then held to account to by their directors. And the fact that directors will be on the hook for this across every business, not just environmental businesses, I think you will see that as a powerful good more than, and, and as I said, it's sometimes the really dull stuff that will make some of the big changes. Um, that doesn't mean all the sexy stuff on environment and, and new technologies isn't really important to show the way, but it's this stuff that will kind of make sure everybody keeps moving in the same direction. So I am hugely optimistic that we have both and I can see both. And then the youth right. movement in this is just adding to the momentum. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, a great place to end. And thank you once again, the three of you, and thank you all of the audience for, for participating. And uh, do keep your eye out for our next panel. And thank you very much indeed.